In the 1970s, a serial killer preyed on teenage girls in Manchester. He was known as the Beast, biting his victims and then returning to their bodies to mutilate them further. One of the officers told me we're looking for a monster here. In this programme, we reveal extraordinary new evidence that offers an insight into the twisted mind of the Beast of Manchester, Trevor Hardy. These documents show the police may have missed an opportunity to prosecute Hardy earlier than they did. He says, I got her across the bywash with the intention of throwing the body in the canal. And that possibly one of his victims' lives could have been saved. I could just feel like I just want to scream now. And after me telling him that he was a murderer and they let him go, he killed her again. Trevor Hardy was a British serial killer who brutally murdered three teenage girls in Manchester between 1974 and 1976. The reason Hardy is virtually unknown is because his crimes were overshadowed by the Yorkshire Ripper, whose murder spree started at the same time. Born in 1945, Trevor Hardy's criminal career started at the age of just eight, when he appeared before magistrates accused of stealing. By 15, he'd become the youngest person ever to be sent to Strangeways Prison. In 1977, Trevor Hardy was sentenced to life imprisonment for triple murder. He served out his sentence in Wakefield Jail until 2012, when he died of a heart attack. Forgotten by his family and the public, Hardy hadn't received a single visitor in the last 15 years of his life. The prison assumed no one would come to his funeral. But then Trevor's estranged brother, Colin Hardy, contacted them. Colin had been haunted by the crimes of his notorious brother for over four decades, but agreed to receive Trevor's effects, which included dozens of boxes of documents. Colin has contacted me to help him try and make sense of what he believes is incriminating new evidence never seen by the public before. Hello. Colin, I'm Jason Payne James. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Colin, what have you got that you want to show me then? Well, you know about my brother, Trevor Hardy. He was a serial killer. He killed a, a few girls. And when he died, they took me into the cell that he occupied. And um, there was all these boxes of documents, boxes and boxes of them. I've still got a box that I think you might find interesting. I think I might. So here we've got a statement. I wonder whether this is put together by his legal team. In a lot of these statements, there's a lot of inconsistencies. They arrested him. Yeah. And then they let him go. And then he killed again. Could the police have done more? I think the police have got a lot to answer for. Why did they let him go? It's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I'll do what I can to try and find out the questions that you want answered, whether we can answer them. We may not be able to. But... I mean, I'm getting too old now for all this. I've lived with it for too long, wondering, could I do more? I'm intrigued to find out what new evidence is in Trevor Hardy's box that has clearly affected Colin so much. My name is Jason Payne James. I'm a specialist in forensic and legal medicine, working with the police and going to courts to review and investigate all kinds of crime. I'd never heard of serial killer Trevor Hardy before Colin contacted me. There's very little about him online, so I'm going to have a trawl through Manchester's archives to see what I can find out. There are no books about Trevor Hardy in the records here. 
So I have to search back through the microfilm archive of the Manchester Evening News. Nearly all the articles I found are from his trial when he was found guilty of the three murders. Wanda Scala was a 17-year-old barmaid who Hardy mugged for her handbag and then beat to death when she resisted. His next victim was Sharon Mossoff, who came across Hardy at night, trying to rob a mill she worked in. He strangled her to death and threw her body into a canal. Janet Leslie Stewart was only 15 when she became Hardy's first victim, whose murder he only admitted to after his arrest for the murders of Wanda Scala and Sharon Mossoff. Hardy says he mistook Janet Stewart for a former girlfriend who'd rejected him. So he went after her and knifed her to death. Years before his killings, Trevor Hardy was terrorizing communities in northeast Manchester. Notorious for long periods in jail, for burglary, mugging and a love of casual violence. Trevor's brother Colin Hardy has suggested I talk to an old family friend who remembers both Colin and Trevor as children. He was a, a known bully. Uh, in fact, we were all frightened of him. Do you think you were the only one who thought that or did most of the people in the community have those uh, views? No, I, I think they all must have thought that. Trevor Hardy actually uh, came across us in a, a back entry and he instructed Colin to hit me. And why was that? For no reason, really. Colin didn't give it his full shot and Trevor eventually took over and gave me a really good whack. I understand later on he, he attacked you more severely. He basically uh, launched himself from like six, eight feet away, headbutted me, uh, which hurt, <laughs> and then um, I thought he'd need me in the side afterwards where I'd only gone about two or three paces and I just saw all the blood on the floor that I realised that he'd actually stabbed me. It went in there and it came out about there, wow. so it didn't actually... So it mit luckily it, it missed, missed vital structures. Missed all the all the organs, yeah. Are you able to sort of sum up your feelings about him or what you believe about him in in, in a couple of sentences or whatever? Yeah, he was, was just an evil person. Uh, nobody liked him, least of all his own family. I need to organise the documents that Trevor Hardy left in his cell which Colin has given me. The reason there's so much here is Hardy fired his legal team during his trial, choosing instead to represent himself and was therefore granted access to all the police's written evidence against him. The box contains an assortment of legal and other documents and Hardy's own letters and statements from jail. Well, what's really interesting is in the uh, documents that Colin's given me is I found a confession written by Trevor Hardy. To me, what's particularly shocking is that he details the murder of the three girls, what he did to them and where he placed them. And there are maps. Here's one example of the map that he's drawn of the location of the murder, of all the surrounding buildings. Fascinating. <laughs> Whilst in prison, it looks as if Trevor Hardy started a decades-long letter-writing campaign to various MPs, Home Secretaries and the police. It seems as if he was trying to get the authorities to look into the unsolved murder of teenager Dorothy Layden in 1971, for which he was always the prime suspect. 17-year-old Dorothy Layden had been attending a concert with friends. On her way home, she was raped, beaten to death, and her body dumped behind a pub. Only four days previously, Hardy had been released from jail early, where he'd been serving a sentence for a violent assault. 
The police questioned him after an anonymous phone call reported he had suspicious scratches on his face. He was released without charge when his mother provided him with an alibi. Amongst the correspondence to Trevor Hardy, I found one letter from a Professor David Wilson, who's a respected criminologist. Hardy had wanted to talk to him about the Dorothy Layden murder. I'm hoping Professor Wilson can give me some insights into the case. Hi, how are you? David, good to see you. Come in. Thank Come you. In. David, what was your first involvement with Trevor Hardy? Well, what's interesting is that I didn't really know that much about Trevor Hardy. He kind of disappeared from public view, and that intrigued me. So I simply wrote to him saying, would he be willing for me to interview him? He was more than keen to do so, because I think he was trying to say that he knew more about the Dorothy Layden case. Two weeks after making contact with him, I'd said in the national newspapers that Trevor Hardy was a serial killer. And as soon as he read the national newspaper saying that I had labelled him as a serial killer, he withdrew um, any willingness to meet with me. He's not a name in the pantheon of British serial killers. Is there anything different about Trevor Hardy in any way? Hardy's different because he's not targeting uh, any of the four groups of women that are normally targeted by British serial killers. The two most consistent groups that they target are female sex workers and women over the age of 60. How he's typical is the level of sadism, the fact that there's misogyny, and the fact that he wants to then subsequently control what it is that we think about him. What's the difference between Dorothy Layden's death and those of the others? There does seem to be an element of accident in relation to him encountering uh, the three victims. Those poor women were in the wrong place at the wrong time. With Dorothy Layden, it felt a very different criminogenic scene to me. A forensic investigation in 1971 found Dorothy Layden had been raped before she was killed. In contrast, Trevor Hardy's known victims were sexually assaulted, but there's no evidence to indicate that they were raped. Yet Hardy was always the police's number one suspect for the Dorothy Layden murder. In his letters from jail, he seemed determined to clear his name and help the police find the real killer. And now I've found the reason why Colin has been so preoccupied by the contents of his brother's box. What's very clear from these letters written by Trevor Hardy to a variety of people over a number of years is that far from just protesting his own innocence, what he's clearly trying to do is implicate his brother Colin Hardy for the murder of Dorothy Layden. For 40 years, it spent every waking moment writing to everybody that I killed Dorothy Layden. I know I didn't kill Dorothy Layden. I believe he did. In it, he describes how, on the 19th of July 1975, 17-year-old barmaid Wanda Scala was mugged for her handbag on her way home late at night. But when she fought back, Hardy hit her with a brick and then tried to make it look like a sexual assault. In a bid to throw the police off his scent, one assumes. In shocking detail, Hardy reveals that he bit off Wanda Scala's nipple and kicked her down below. 
And most frightening of all, Hardy admits in the confession he gets pleasure from the murder. He even boasted about it to his brother, Colin. He says, have you been interviewed by, about the Scala murder? So I said, why should I be interviewed? He said, well, I did it. And my brain just sort of shut down. If I was scared before and wanted to get away, I was terrified then. And he just went totally berserk. And he left me unconscious on the floor. Colin Hardy plucked up the courage to call the police to tell them his brother had committed the murder. And they said, we picked him up and he's in another part of the station. So I thought, thank God for that. You know, they've got him. The police had their man arrested on suspicion of murder. Wanda Scala's body had been recovered from a shallow grave next to a building site. In this post-mortem report I found, it says most of the right nipple had been removed, apparently by biting. A swab was taken from the wound, which contained traces of saliva. A biologist took the swab and compared it to a sample of Hardy's saliva to see if they were of the same blood group. It was concluded that the saliva found on Wanda Scala's body could have originated from Hardy. I've also discovered the police sent Hardy to a dental hospital for another crucial forensic investigation. I found this statement, which is particularly significant. It's by James Holt, a dental surgeon, who created an impression of Trevor Hardy's upper teeth and from those made a model. He then compared that model with photographs of the bite mark on Wanda Scala. And he concluded that that bite mark was consistent with the dental model and the dental impression that he'd created from Trevor Hardy. This is the most important piece of evidence I've found amongst Hardy's documents so far. But it seems to have been ignored or overlooked at the time because, while police awaited the dental results, Hardy was released after he was given an alibi by his alcoholic girlfriend. I thought, this is, this is absolutely crazy. I said, just... I've just told him he's admitted to a murder and he's walking the streets. It appears Dr Holt's dental evidence, plus the saliva match, for whatever reason, wasn't considered enough to charge Hardy. Various newspapers ran stories during Hardy's trial, presumably based on his confession that somehow, whilst held in custody, he used a nail file on his teeth to avoid being linked to the killings. But it's not clear from the documents if he managed to do so. I'm travelling to Cardiff to meet a professor of forensic dentistry who worked with Dr Holt in the 1960s. There is a possibility that Trevor Hardy tried to change his teeth profile by in some way obtaining a file and trying to file down his teeth. Is that something that you've either come across or you think would be feasible? I dealt with uh, something like 400 bite marks of a criminal nature and I only ever came across one case. The teeth are the hardest bit of any living animal in nature by a long way. But what are the chances of that being able to realistically alter They're not profile? high. They're not high. I'm not saying it would have been impossible, but some, it would have taken a long, long time. And even then, the changes would have been absolutely minimal. You've seen um, the statement that Dr Holt produced. His conclusion, it appears, was that the bite mark on Wanda Scala 
was consistent with Trevor Hardy's yes. impression. What are your views on that? Knowing Dr. Holt, he was a very, very punctilious operator. And if he said it was consistent, he would have thought it was. I'm certain of that. Do you think that would have been a trigger for, them, for the police to actually at least think that they might need to investigate Trevor Hardy a bit further? I am very, very surprised that that case didn't appear to have been taken any further at that point. I think it should. Just three days after the assault in the pub, 18-year-old Sharon Mossoff was murdered by Trevor Hardy. Sharon came across Hardy late at night trying to break into the Marlborough Mill where she worked. When she tried to stop him, she was stabbed, strangled and her body thrown into the nearby canal. It was right on the front of the paper. Another girl killed in Manchester. And I knew, I knew. I knew it was him, I knew it was Trevor. And I just, I just went to pieces. After me telling him that he was a murderer and they let him go, he killed again. And I've had to live with that all my life, wondering if I could have done any more. Soon after Sharon Mossoff's murder, the police were questioned on what seemed a spate of local killings. There have been, though, haven't there, two other still unsolved murders in the surrounding area during the past five years. How likely is it that there is, in fact, a link? I've no evidence at this stage to connect those other murders with this one. I'm treating this one on its own at this stage. But there were connections. Just like with Wanda Scala, Hardy had bitten off one of Sharon Mossoff's nipples. And these two unsolved murders also had a geographical connection. The women were attacked very close to the Rochdale Canal. The Rochdale Canal was Trevor's, like, either way. He'd used the Rochdale Canal in the middle of the night. He kept off the main roads. He knew that not a lot of people used the canal at night. He just knew every little way to evade if he needed to. I want to retrace the final movements of Sharon Mossoff, the night she had the terrible misfortune to cross paths with Trevor Hardy. I'm trying to orientate myself um, according to the map that uh, Trevor Hardy drew, signed by him in his confession. What we're looking for is the, uh, uh, the lock, which we have here, the bywash, which is over the other side. We have Marlborough Mill, which he was trying to break into, lying across there. And if we walk over this way, he says that he killed her over there. And then he specifically says, I got her across the bywash with the intention of throwing the body in the canal. Well, there's the bywash. Remember, it was um, icy and cold then. And he then describes, I took the clothes off without ripping them, except the dress, which was torn anyway. I bundled the clothes up and left them lying on the bank. Well, for me, the detailed description is very, very compelling. I'm seeing how he's described, and even to this day, Several decades later, all these features are readily identifiable. Hardy went into hiding after the murder of Sharon Mossoff. 
Six weeks later, a surveillance operation in relation to his attack on the woman in the pub led detectives to his girlfriend's flat in Stockport, where he was arrested on the 23rd of April, 1976. In custody, Hardy was questioned about the murders of Wanda Scala and Sharon Mossoff and eventually confessed to killing both of them when his girlfriend withdrew her alibi for him. But then he dropped a bombshell and admitted to a murder that the police hadn't even been aware of. That of 15-year-old schoolgirl Janet Leslie Stewart, who'd gone missing on New Year's Eve 1974. I've discovered in Trevor Hardy's box the sickening reason why she was never found. It looks like he's hand-drawn this map of where he buried Janet Stewart's body. He says in his confession he returned to her shallow grave several times to pull apart the bones with his bare hands. He dismembered her corpse and scattered it to avoid detection. I was disgusted, absolutely disgusted. The way it was described, no human being would do that. Hardy was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murders of Wanda Scala, Sharon Mossoff and Janet Leslie Stewart. In jail, the police questioned Trevor Hardy again about the unsolved murder of Dorothy Layden in 1971. He remained the prime suspect, but continued to protest his innocence. He even wrote this extraordinary 140-page statement whilst in jail that's really surprised me. Found this statement, written by Trevor Hardy again, um, when he was at HMP Wakefield, so I guess after he was transferred there in the 1990s, uh, what's interesting is that he doesn't admit to anything in this, contradicting everything he said in his original confession. Just as he did with his letters to people in authority, in this statement, Hardy also spends a lot of time writing about his brother Colin and trying to implicate him in Dorothy Layden's murder. I think he... he... He did it, and he got some perverse pleasure teasing everybody. Where did his obsession come from? Trevor Hardy was one of Britain's most brutal serial killers, yet his name is barely known. I've been examining documents left in his cell that might offer some clues as to if he was responsible for the unsolved Dorothy Layden murder in 1971. In the statement he wrote from jail and the letters he wrote to dozens of people in authority, Hardy implies that his brother, Colin, was responsible for Dorothy Layden's death, a murder for which Trevor Hardy was always the number one suspect. And all them years he spent in prison, I think he got his kicks I was writing all the letters he did, accusing me and seizing the police. Why did he spend so much time trying to frame Colin? What was his motivation? Dr Kiva Makanena is a forensic psychologist who I hope can help me answer some of these questions. What are your uh, initial thoughts about how Trevor Hardy came to be as he was? Certainly there are a lot of factors from his childhood and from his upbringing that are mentioned in the papers that I've seen that would explain a lot of behavioural disturbance later on in life. His father was violent, um, his father was an alcoholic, and that his mother was overprotective. But without being, I think, caring and without being able to protect him from his father's violence. Throughout his 35 years or so in prison, um, he constantly... Uh, tried to pin the blame for Dorothy Layden's murder, for which he wasn't convicted, on his brother Colin. Are you able to make any sense of that? 
going back to his early childhood development, there was certainly evidence of a lot of resentment towards his brother. So that might go some way towards explaining after his younger brother was born. And that was obviously something that stayed with him. So he's obviously spent hours and hours constructing and writing that account of his brother's guilt. Um, seems to have, perhaps it gave him pleasure. And so that to me points to something very profoundly disturbed going on. Most of these letters may be the work of complete fantasy, but in some of them, Trevor Hardy does make some compelling connections between Dorothy Layden and Wanda Scala, his second victim. Trevor Hardy says that both Wanda Scala and Dorothy Layden were battered to death with a brick, both lived within a quarter of a mile of each other, and in both cases, anonymous phone calls were made about Trevor Hardy. What he seems to be implying is that whoever killed Dorothy Layden killed Wanda Scala too, but that wasn't him. I wonder, was this just a game he was playing because he'd got away with Dorothy Layden's murder? I've made contact with a journalist who reported on the Dorothy Layden murder in 1971, and then Wanda Scala and Sharon Mossos' deaths five years later. I hope he can throw some light on the similarities. With everything you know about the case, and you've got a pretty encyclopedic knowledge of it, were you aware at any stage of any new information that came to light later on that might have um, put Trevor Hardy in the frame for Dorothy Layden's killing? Well, in point of fact, when um, Hardy had been arrested for the murders of Sharon and uh, Wanda, I said to one of my police contacts, who was a detective on the case, I think you ought to look at the Dorothy Layden case, because I remembered it from five years previously. There were great similarities between her age and the uh, modus operandi of the killer. One of the uh, officers told me, we're looking for a monster here. So do you think, was, was it ever taken further, or did other people raise concerns? Well, I was surprised that... Uh, it was never um, uh, proceeded with. And then I later heard that um, the police had obtained evidence that showed that Trevor Hardy couldn't have been the killer of Dorothy Layden. I'm still pretty much in the dark as to what it is that they thought they'd found uh, that established that Trevor Hardy had not killed Dorothy Layden, because I'm still of the view that he did. Yes, sir. Jason Payne James. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Come in. Thank you very much. Just coming to the Dorothy Layden murder, it seems to be that there was some form of evidence that subsequently well, produced a DNA sample. I know there was semen found at the scene, and we, we've only seen the notes and spots of Bobby's who went. I see. But it wasn't on the body. So not, not on the body or no. the clothes? Or now, unless they found something since, it was on a flagstone near to the body, but not on the body. People have sex in all kinds of places. If you've got a DNA sample that you can't identify, it doesn't include or exclude anyone. It's no. just a DNA sample where yeah. somebody's, somebody's, been there. Yeah. somebody's been there. It could be anyone. Yeah. yeah. Again, I didn't go to the scene, but when we talked it through with the lads on the B Division, most certainly their opinion was it doesn't have to be his. I'm confused how the cold case unit at Greater Manchester Police can be certain that this DNA evidence they found next to Dorothy Layden's body was definitely the killer's. Head of the cold case unit at Greater Manchester Police, Martin Bottomley, is willing to try and explain. 
In terms of the information that you had about Dorothy Layden, did you come across new information or was it reviewing all the evidence that was already presented? Uh, the evidence, much of, some of it had been lost, some of it had been stored, so I did a search of GMP's property stores and found swabs taken from the crime scene, uh, the crime scene stains, and we sent them to the Forensic Science Laboratory. And to my amazement, so many years later, it, they revealed the full uh, DNA profile of Dorothy's killer. And where was that um, swab taken from? Yeah, the swab was taken from uh, material directly uh, adjacent to Dorothy. So there may be um, DNA samples deposited for a number of reasons, people having sex out in the open or whatever. Um, is it clear that this DNA did originate from Dorothy Layden's killer? It's absolutely clear in my mind that the documentation I had from uh, forensic scientists, from photographs that uh, I was able to, to view from the scene which were taken at the time, I, I was convinced then and I'm convinced now that, yes, the DNA was from Dor Dorothy's killer. At the time of Dorothy Layden's killing, there was no DNA absolutely national not. database. Yeah. So the process, you had this sample, you had um, a DNA profile. What, how do you deal with that? Well, Dorothy's family had said to us, you know, uh, we believe Trevor Hardy is responsible for this. And I went to interview Trevor Hardy in prison with a colleague, took his DNA sample and my swab, interviewed him about his knowledge of the killing. Uh, he denied any involvement. I was sceptical at first, but uh, once we'd submitted his uh, DNA swab for profiling, again at the Forensic, Forensic Science Laboratory, they came back and said, no, this profile does not match the crime scene stain. Did it match anyone or...? or, or... No. 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 So the police are saying DNA found at the Dorothy Layden crime scene didn't match Trevor Hardy's or anyone else's on the National DNA database. Maybe I'm missing something, but in my opinion, if the DNA was not on Dorothy's body or clothing, it may not necessarily have originated from Dorothy Layden's killer. So I've come to speak to one of the world's leading DNA experts to see how the police can be sure this semen they've discovered can definitely be the killers. With regard to Dorothy Layden's uh, death, uh, we know that at a cold case review, a sample, it appears it's a swab sample of uh, cellular material was identified near the deceased body. Would that have any necessary significance to that body itself? Well, obviously its location would be of interest. However, that sample, whatever it was, could have predated the body being there. The Greater Manchester Police are clear that the DNA profile that they have is from the killer of Dorothy Layden. And this is the sample that's apparently of semen on a paving stone. How would you say that they can be sure that that DNA profile is from Dorothy Layden's killer, if those are the circumstances? I can't see how that particular bit of evidence can say that it is from the killer. All it can say is whoever left that semen has deposited that semen on that paving stone at some point in time. So there appears to be a piece of the jigsaw missing in the Dorothy Layden murder, not accessible to me or the public, but known only to the cold case review team. So having seen Denise, uh, what we have established is really what we knew already, is that she, like me, is puzzled as to how the DNA evidence, where they've got a complete profile, they exclude Trevor Hardy as the killer, and they say that it must come from whoever killed Dorothy Layden. There must be other information that we don't know about that the police have, for whatever reason, which may be part of their investigation, which remains live. A spokesperson for Greater Manchester Police said, We do not believe it is in the interests of justice, and indeed it hampers the investigative process, to suggest Hardy murdered Dorothy. The DNA evidence in this case, in the opinion of both Greater Manchester Police and the Crown Prosecution Service, is incontrovertible.
Next, I'm paying one final visit to Manchester to share my findings with Colin Hardy. He ruined most of my life. He's not going to ruin the rest of it. And the family of Sharon Mosser, whose death may have been avoided had the police acted upon the evidence available to them. I feel like I just feel like I just want to scream now. I'm coming to the end of my investigation into Britain's forgotten serial killer, the Beast of Manchester, Trevor Hardy. I think I've uncovered some serious shortcomings in the police's investigation into Trevor Hardy's three murders. There was clear forensic evidence linking Trevor Hardy to the murder of Wanda Scala. For some reason, it was never acted upon, and he went on to kill his third victim, Sharon Mossoff. Today's police procedures may have drawn a very different conclusion. I've come to meet Sharon Mossoff's sister and two of her brothers. I think they have a right to know what I've found. Jason, hello, nice Jason. Nice and Mark. Hi, Jason. Nice to meet you. Maxine Paul, Mark, as you know, what um, we've been doing for the last um, couple of months is reviewing papers that were left in Trevor Hardy's cell after he died. What we have found is that there is um, a statement from a dentist, a forensic specialist, who shortly after Wanda Scala's death had taken an impression of Trevor Hardy's upper teeth and had been able to match it with the bite mark on Wanda Scala. I can recall something about um, him filing his own teeth down, if they had evidence that the, these bite marks matched. I, I don't see why you would let him go. Well, this is the big question that, that, that I can't answer. Who can answer that question? Is it something that's never going to be known? Can there not be an inquiry into why? Is it just because if he'd have been arrested, she wouldn't be here now, wouldn't she? Yeah. That's um, the conclusion that you have to come to. I feel like I just feel like I just want to scream now. Quite angry about that, really. It's, you know, it's, it seems like people are not doing their job properly, really. They should have kept him on the evidence that, that they had. I think. At least the police should afford us an apology or an explanation into why they didn't think that this evidence was worth looking into. Greater Manchester Police said... It was only at Trevor Hardy's trial in 1977 that sufficient evidence to secure his convictions for murder was available to be presented in court. Neither the trial judge in 1977 nor GMP today, with the benefit of four decades of hindsight, have been presented with any evidence to show the investigating officers did anything other than act diligently and within the legal constraints that the rules of evidence and the judicial system rightly demand. I'm still surprised that they had Trevor Hardy in custody and they let him go. There's one more person I must see before I leave Manchester, Colin Hardy. I'm returning his brother Trevor's box of documents and letters accusing him of killing Dorothy Layden and want to tell him the results of my investigation. I think from the circumstantial evidence, it certainly would appear that Trevor could have killed Dorothy Layden. But there isn't the clear evidence that we can say for definite that he did. And the police are very adamant that they believe it's someone else. So that remains a mystery. I just, uh, I find it very hard to be with you. I think that from your point of view, what I'm hoping is that you put Trevor behind you and you move on with your life, with your family. It's got to end. I can't keep doing this to myself. Every waking moment, writing to everybody that I killed Dorothy Layden.
with nine. One, switch that over, I stay down. I was at the West Coast, now I'm in the East Coast. Shawty wanna.